But there are people who are not uh, fans of Trump and not allies of Trump who I think are responsibly raising the question, the concern, what is the level of seriousness of a crime on the part of a former president that justifies bringing it? And they're really great arguments and I struggle with it. Welcome to G-Zero World, I'm Ian Bremmer, and on today's episode, we are talking about it. You know, it, that thing that everyone has been talking about, that thing that sucks all the oxygen out of the room and promises to do so for at least the next year, if not longer. Former president has been indicted, and the country has never seen anything like it. The most politically corrosive criminal trial in history is poised to unfold while the defendant runs for president. It's bigger than OJ, it's huge. What could possibly go wrong? Today, I'm asking former federal prosecutor, Preet Bharara. But first. For the first time in history, a US president has been arrested. Shocking, but not unexpected. He received plenty of warnings. As they say, no man is above the law. The crime, racing his horses and buggy down a residential Washington, D.C. street. In 1872, 150 years before former President Trump walked into a Manhattan courthouse and surrendered to law enforcement, then-President Ulysses S. Grant had a need for speed. The residents of 13th Street had been complaining for weeks about gangs of horse and buggy drivers terrorizing their neighborhoods. Gangs that somehow included the President of the United States. And just the previous day, police officer William West had let Grant off with a warning. The arrest does not appear to have been reported at the time, but in 1908, the Sunday Star of Washington published an interview with then-retired Officer West. Do you think, officer, that I was violating the speed laws? West remembers the president asking. I do, Mr. President, West replied. Grant's face had, quote, the look of a schoolboy who had been caught in a guilty act by his teacher. The president then offered West, a black man and a fellow Civil War veteran, a ride back to the police station in his own private carriage. Kind of cool. Swapping war stories along the way. Grant was released after putting up $20 in bail. That's roughly 500 bucks today. And in the weeks following the incident, he defended the officer's action. Quote, complimenting West on his fearlessness in making arrests. Other U.S. presidents have faced criminal investigation, most notably Presidents Nixon and Clinton, but not since Grant has a commander-in-chief been arrested. Now, in truth, the Trump and Grant incidents could not be more different. As plenty, a cable news pundit has pointed out, Trump's indictment has cast the country into uncharted legal waters. How will an already deeply divided nation withstand such a polarizing trial, with the defendant at the same time running again for president? It remains to be seen if New York District Attorney Alvin Bragg has the goods to win a conviction or if his indictments will even be the last that Trump faces. But at least we can take heart in knowing that in one very specific way, history will not repeat itself. President Trump doesn't go anywhere without a chauffeur. Here to tackle those weedy legal questions and much, much more is former federal prosecutor Preet Bharara. Preet Bharara, it's so good to see you, as always. Good to be back, sir. Thank you. So I mean, we want to get to all the Trump stuff, but I don't want to start with it. I wanted to ask you first about Clarence Thomas. Some people are saying he should resign. Um, not many, to be fair. But it's this ProPublica investigation, yeah. uh, benefits, gifts, largesse yeah. um, that he took uh, for 20-some years um, from some billionaire and did not disclose. Do we care? I think we care. I think there are varying levels of concern, depending on how seriously you view the optics of it and how seriously you view the appearance of a conflict. Um, you know, I don't think that he has violated necessarily any specific rule. It may not look good. It may look terrible. And I'll explain all the reasons why it looks terrible and it shouldn't have been done in the first place. But maybe not a, a, an, al a, maybe not a, an actual uh, statutory violation, ethical violation, because there are rules that say that govern all judges, that say gifts of a certain amount have to be disclosed or you shouldn't take them. Uh, and, in, and that includes uh, personal hospitalities. It's not a good look for the judiciary. 
It's not a good look for the Supreme Court. It's not a good look for Clarence Thomas in particular, because this is the second or third time in recent months that he's been uh, surrounded by controversy. Uh, the most recent time with his wife, <clears throat> Ginny Thomas. Yeah, uh, his wife has been involved in uh, and been associated with people who were involved in January sixth. A lot of people have advocated for Clarence Thomas to recuse himself from decisions relating <clears throat> to the investigation of January 6th. He hasn't done that. And at a time when I think confidence and trust no. in the integrity of the court is low, it's not a great thing to have done. Who, by the way, there's no evidence that uh, Clarence Thomas voted in any particular way because of his association or friendship with this conservative billionaire. People might also argue in defense of Clarence Thomas. Um, I'm not defending him, but people have argued. But Clarence Thomas is a dyed-in-the-wool conservative. He doesn't need convincing of conservative doctrine. He already is one. But when uh, you know, other members of the public, including members of Congress, including most state officials, when I was in the Justice Department, I couldn't take so much as a sandwich from somebody. Um, in those circumstances, when you have the nine most powerful justices in the world, or in the country, I'm sorry, to take what is the equivalent of hundreds of thousands of dollars in uh, accommodations and travel, mm from somebody who you know, might have interests that are implicated, you know, generally speaking, by the court, it's not great. So, okay, let's move on to the topic that is gathering so much media attention right now, which is the Trump um, indictments, Trump yeah. felonies, for 34 felony charges. Um, uh, before we talk specifically about the case, let me ask you, is the media, uh, are we covering this too much? This is the first time I'm covering it, but is that too much? No, it's not too much because I'm here. Okay, good. But generally speaking, too much coverage? You know, I don't, I don't know. It's a, it's a huge thing. It's a significant thing. Is it bigger than OJ? Yeah, it's bigger than OJ. For you? It's bigger than OJ because it has implications for um, how we view our democracy. It has implications for how we think about the rule of law. It has implications for what we think is uh, the standard of justice for everyone and whether or not there's a double standard. Um, it has implications for the political race in 2024. It has, it has so many implications, it is utterly unprecedented, and so it's not surprising that every outlet in the country wants to cover it. And by the way, it might be just step one. Right. right. Well, I'm asking you in part because of this case. We can talk about step two, step three, but this case specifically, well, the, the Bragg case, case, case is always, in is New going York. to get a lot of attention. Yeah. Because it's the first one. But it's the least important, right? Isn't it? I don't know if it's the least important one. Um, I think there's an argument to be made of the four things that Trump has criminal exposure on that we know about and that are ongoing. It's, it's the least serious conduct because it doesn't go like some of the other matters do to the core of American democracy right. or to, to national security classification and sensitivity. So, yeah, I think that's not an unfair thing to say. Now, um, you know uh, Alvin Bragg, uh, I do. who has brought um, this case. Do you? There are a lot of people out there, including some Democrats, that are saying that this is politicized. Um, you know, what wasn't, these charges were not brought uh, under a previous uh, prosecutor. Uh, do talk a little bit about what you think is motivating Bragg in this case. I think what's motivating Alvin Bragg in this case, who used to work for me, and um, in full disclosure, I endorsed him in his race for Manhattan DA. I haven't agreed with everything he's done. He's done some things on <clears throat> on the, the local crime side, street crime side, that I think he's been criticized for, and you know he's answered that, some of that. Uh, I think he's made the decision based on the facts and the law. Like, this is a person who was handed another case against Donald Trump relating to um, inflated assets or deflated assets, depending on what the Trump organization was trying to do, got so much criticism for it that someone, uh, two people resigned from his office, uh, who are also well-known uh, criminal defense attorneys, but also former prosecutors, angry at Alvin Bragg for not pursuing, for not a, case. pursuing a particular case against Trump. Yeah. Now, you can disagree with that. Uh, we won't know because we don't know all the facts when we're in the grand jury. But the fact that he had a case like that handed to him by well-respected prosecutors who were really angry that he didn't pursue it, that's not the kind of person who's grasping at straws and jumping at the first opportunity to charge the former president of the United States. That, to me, shows that he looked carefully deliberated. And again, we can disagree. Maybe there's a case that should have been brought. Maybe this one shouldn't be brought. We'll be able to you know, figure that out in the fullness of time. Yeah. So I give him the benefit of the doubt because of that track record and experience. And here he saw, he saw another case, and reasonable people can differ. These are judgment calls that need to be made. Um, is it the most serious crime in the history of the world? No, it's an E felony, 34 E felonies, which is the lowest level of e felony. E felony. It's the lowest level of felony in That New York. is a classification of felony. Classification of a felony. Yeah. It doesn't mean, doesn't mean excellent. Mm. Um, it doesn't mean electric. Yeah. Uh, 
But at the same time, what I keep coming back to is, you know, when, when the supporters of Trump say again and again um, from their, uh, you know, podiums, that nobody would ever be prosecuted for something like this, it's too trivial, um, I have two responses. One, mm. falsification of business records stepped up to a felony mm. is charged in New York State all the time. Mm. And this particular conduct that's at the core of the, of the question with respect to Donald Trump in the Manhattan DA's case has been charged successfully against another actual human being who you may have heard of, Michael Cohen. So it's not like people who have engaged in similar well, conduct. Donald Trump's former attorney. Former attorney. Yes. Pled guilty to it in the Southern District of New York, yeah. my former office. Went to prison in part for this. The judge thought it was a crime and accepted the guilty plea. So, so, so you have somebody who definitionally is less culpable and responsible for this very conduct. I think you can make a powerful argument that it's good and right and proper to charge the more culpable person, Donald Trump. But, but I think people are, in, are raising in good faith, not everyone, but there are people who are not uh, fans of Trump and not allies of Trump who I think are responsibly raising the question, the concern, what is the level of seriousness of a crime on the part of a former president that justifies bringing it? And they're really great arguments, and I struggle with this. On the one hand, we say no one is above the law, and if something is indictable and prosecutable, and you can convict on it, as happened with Michael Cohen, justice requires in this American system one standard, not two standards. You have to hold this other person accountable, even if it was the former president of the United States. On the other hand, prudential democratic concerns suggest, well, how does it look when one administration is going after the leader of the prior administration, no matter how um, justifiable it is, no matter how much evidence you have, if it's not that serious, the argument is, how does it look to other countries? How does it look to future generations? Does it look like it's political? Does it how does it look, like look to future presidents? How does it look to future presidents? I get that. And, and by the way, I think here there's a good faith argument for supporting the prosecution. <clears throat> And there's a good faith argument for being concerned about it, given the level now, of, of crime here. As you said before, this is potentially uh, only the first step. There are lots of yeah. other, well, several, three other uh, sort of potential charges that are out there, right? We've got the uh, issues of classified documents being mishandled. Um, we've got the issues of uh, his involvement around January 6th. And then we have the issue around the Georgian uh, Election. elections yeah. and the, with, with the call. Uh, if, if you had to talk about those three, rank them, prioritize them in terms of severity, which you think mattered the most. Could you do that for me quickly? There's a disconnect a little bit between the likelihood of a case being brought yeah. and the seriousness of the conduct being investigated. The most serious conduct being investigated, I think, <clears throat> without question, is the January 6th matter. It goes to the heart of the peaceful transfer of power. Um, it has as its, its essence anti-democratic forces, authoritarian and um, you know, propagandistic, the big lie uh, origins. That's what was driving it. I think it shook the capital to its foundation. And a lot of people ended up going to jail as a consequence yeah, of that. People, and people died. People died. Like that, yeah. that's, that's a big deal. That's something that's never happened in our country before. That's something we can't countenance. That's something if we can hold people responsible uh, for it, not just the people who breached the capital, but people like the former president of the United States. That is far and away the most serious. I think the argument is likely that what's happening in Georgia, what's being investigated in Georgia, is part of the January 6th thing, right? It's part of the big lie. It's part of trying to undo democratic process and steal an, an election, which is very, very important and, and a lot of gravity attached to it. Um, the reason I'm hesitating is on the classified documents, I, I don't think that he's gonna be charged with uh, mishandling of classified documents, it's a tough charge to bring. Um, a lot of other people do it. Well, it depends on what level of intent. Mm -hmm. I think the, the greatest likelihood is, based on reporting and what we know publicly about the conduct of the president and his uh, lawyers and others, is obstruction of justice. And obstruction of justice, I think, is a very serious crime, but probably is not as serious as shaking the foundations of our principle of peaceful transfer of power, but it's not unserious. No. And all three of them, as we say it, probably more serious in terms of the nature of the conduct than falsification of business records. So whether or not he's convicted of that, of course, we've also had an impeachment process about that very issue. Yeah. Um, and he was impeached. Uh, an unprecedented second impeachment for a sitting president, he was not convicted. Correct. That is the process that uh, an executive is yep. meant to go through. And, you know, I, I teach at NYU Law School, and I offer this as a, as a paper topic mm -hmm. to students um, in the last couple of years, discuss the propriety of the Department of Justice investigating Trump and potentially charging him for conduct that was already explored by the Congress. Um, the argument in favor of not pursuing it by the Department of Justice is 
as you put in the stem of your question, this is how our system handles it. Um, when you've got the head of the executive branch and you have uh, the legislative branch, to, you know, separate but equal branches of government, are at an impasse, you handle it through the political process. Double jeopardy doesn't attach because it's not the same forum, it's not the same court, it's not the same process. You know, um, during the course of both impeachments, I would point out to people that even though they called it a trial, most of the hallmarks of an actual trial or fair trial are not present. You don't have people, um, you know, the, the jurors are also the ones who are witnesses in, in, in connection with the January 6th event. Um, you know, we tell, we tell jurors to keep an open mind. They're not allowed to read press about the case in an actual criminal trial in this country. Here, the jurors who are, who are senators are not only watching the news, they're making news. They're previewing their, not in every instance, but they're previewing what they think about the case. There's no real judge. Um, the rules of evidence don't apply. Hearsay is admissible, all sorts of things. But it still is the process. It's the process. The Justice Department has a separate process. And the Constitution also makes clear um, that impeachment or no, a president of the United States is subject to criminal sanction still after he leaves office. As this plays out, right, I mean, and, and these, these cases are going to take a while, yeah. uh, and Trump is running for the nomination. He is certainly the favorite at this point to get the nomination. Um, let's imagine he's found guilty of one or more of these charges. He's not yet president. Um, what does that mean, in your view, for his ability Nothing. to pursue that run? Nothing. He, he can be um, pending trial. He can be charged. He can be convicted. He can be in prison, as far as I understand it, and still run for <clears throat> and, and win the presidency. Historically, you might predict that if someone gets convicted of a crime, um, they would lose votes. Uh, we not had a situation where someone was on the verge of, of being convicted of committing a crime, this may be one of it's those less clear yeah. in this circumstance. Yeah. That's right. Look, and in other countries, people have been convicted of crimes and come back and run for office. But I think the scenario I mentioned a second ago of being convicted and being in prison and running for, for the presidency is not likely to arise in, in the situation with respect to the Manhattan DA's office case because I don't think Trump is getting any jail time. And I think people may not appreciate that given the level of the felony. So why, why do you think Trump would yeah, not get jail time in this case? The argument is that someone of his age with his lack of criminal record and based on the seriousness of the conduct would be unlikely to get a jail sentence. And by the way, this is all, I'm not sure this should factor in. It's all complicated by the fact that we say everyone is equal and no one is above the law, but we do treat former presidents differently. And one way we treat them differently is we give them secret service details for the rest of their life because we feel that they're important assets of the country, if you will, and we protect them. So the idea that in a, in a, in a case of this level of seriousness, given all the other circumstances I mentioned, um, and the Secret Service issue and the safety of a, of a former president, I find it hard to believe a judge would sentence him to prison. But, so, but just so everyone is, that's paying attention gets what we're saying here, um, you said before that this is going to get vastly more attention than OJ, and you think deservedly so. It's also going to play out almost certainly over the course of the election. So, you know, we're going to be in 2024 voting for yeah. the presidency and assuming Trump gets the nomination. All of this is going on real time when people are going to the ballot box. Yeah. Look, I mean, what's funny about this is, nothing funny about this actually, but the irony is, as we were saying earlier, like when the shoe's on the other foot, people say something very different. They sing a different tune. Donald Trump made it a feature of his campaign and his uh, competition with Hillary Clinton. To say lock her up. And to say someone who's under criminal investigation, that if the FBI is investigating you, you're not fit for office. And she was never even charged. Donald Trump once said that if you plead the fifth, that means you're guilty. He has pled the fifth in recent times in New York State. So it's all, it's all new stuff. We'll it, see how it goes. Pre Prara, thanks so much, man. Thanks, Ian. That's our show this week. Come back next week if you like what you see, or even if you don't, but you just want to know, hey, what other indictments can we come up with to charge a former president? Maybe a sitting president, who knows? Could be exciting. I want to take a minute to sign up for our most excellent morning newsletter. It's called G Zero Daily.